So if you're watching this video, it's probably because you want some analysis of Simon Armitage's The Manhunt, which is excellent, you've come to the right place. However, as you can see up here, you can see that I've already analysed at least half of it. So uh, there's part one, this is part two. Make sure you watch part one first. And with that out of the way, here comes the analysis. This is where we left off in the last video. I hope you had time to look at those questions and maybe even to make some notes of your own. However, now we're going to look at some of my ideas for those two questions. Skirting along is quite light or casual in tone, suggesting that loving Eddie is easy for Laura and that she does not find understanding his trauma to be a chore. However, skirting does mean to go around the edge of something, so there's a slight hint of precarity there. She is perhaps walking on eggshells, so as to not set off an episode within Eddie. This light tone almost normalises Eddie's PTSD, and shows how used to dealing with it Laura is and how aware she is of how dangerous it can be. The scan and the fetus of metal helped create an extended metaphor whereby a bullet, which itself could be a symbol of Eddie's PTSD, is compared to a baby. Now, having a kid, I'm led to believe at least, is a life-changing experience, and so, Armitage is expressing how severe the effects of war were on Eddie, as well as on his and Laura's relationship. Also, this extended metaphor could show how war has infantilised Eddie. Laura must look after him, as he's unable to normally function in the everyday world. And now we have the final three stanzas of the poem. There are one two, three, four uh, questions that I'd like to consider here. So what are your ideas? Uh, pause now to have a go at annotating the poem yourself or wait a couple moments and see my ideas. If you do have your own ideas, which is excellent, feel free to share them in the comment section. Sweating has been used to describe the unexploded mind, which we'll look at in a moment. It's worth thinking that people sweat when they feel anxious and stressed, which are symptoms of PTSD. So a metaphor has been used to compare Eddie's PTSD to an unexploded mine. It is hidden, dangerous, and could go off at any moment. It is also buried beneath the surface. As of most mental illness, it's not immediately visible to someone who is not looking for it. By mentioning both Eddie's mind and his body, Armitage is expressing that his PTSD manifests in both mental and physical suffering. Eddie has also been placed in something of a passive role here. The PTSD is doing things to him that he cannot control. He's powerless. The half frame at the end of the poem could represent a number of things. Here, I suggest that the half frame is representative of the fact that Eddie's healing process is incomplete. However, as with the rest of the poem, it could also be representative of Laura and Eddie's relationship. They are getting closer to completeness. But they too have some way to go as they learn to work with or around Eddie's illness. Now that we've analysed the poem closely, it's time to step back and consider the poem holistically. To do that, we're going to consider the poem's meaning, mood and motivation. Having an idea about the three M's, as I call them, uh, it will help you in a number of ways. 
Firstly, if you make notes about the poem's meaning, mood, and motivation, you'll have something of like a, a mini fact file about the poem, which is something that you could have a look at in order to warm up your mind and best prepare yourself to revise or write about this poem. Doing this should also help your analysis and essay writing, as a quick summary of the three M's could act as an introduction or overview to your essay. But what are the three M's? I hear you ask. Well, meaning's pretty straightforward, right? What is the poem about? If you can add context to that, great. Remember, context is equal to a third of the marks. Mood is also pretty straightforward. What is the mood, tone, or atmosphere of this poem? Why do you have that idea? Again, if you can use context to explain why Armitage chose this mood or, or moods, even better. Motivation is a little less straightforward, I guess. Motivation considers why the poet wrote the poem they wrote in the way that they wrote it. Context is a must here, as although we can't know for certain why Armitage wrote this poem, we could make an educated guess based on what we know about him, his life, and when he was writing the poem. Evaluative verbs will make this section all the better as it will your analysis more generally. If you're not too sure about what I mean by that, um, let me know. I'll see if I can make a quick video about it in future. If you want to tackle the three M's on your own, feel free to pause the video now and make notes. Otherwise, my ideas will appear on screen in a couple of moments. So there's my summary of the poem. Uh, I said that this poem is about a wife, Laura Beddoes, trying to help her husband, Eddie Beddoes, deal with the PTSD he suffers from as a result of serving as a peacekeeper during the Bosnian War. He is weak both physically and mentally, and their relationship suffers somewhat as a result. As you can see, uh, I've used bits of context throughout, whilst also trying to cover the whole poem. And there's my ideas about the moods present in the poem. I've mentioned two different moods, as there is a slight shift towards the end of the poem. Writing about how a mood might change as a poem progresses is something that can help you to achieve the top marks. So I've acknowledged there in my top sort of tiny paragraph, sentence, whatever you want to call it, uh, that there's a loving and caring tone. I've given a quotation there, a bit of context too. And then I've said how at the end of the poem, there's a hopeful tone created by that half rhyme. And finally, there's my ideas about Armitage's motivation. Again, I've used lots of context there whilst using three different evaluative verbs. It's quite long, so I'll, uh, I'll let you read that at your own leisure. Now here we've got a theme table. I'll go through the different themes in a moment and, and whether or not they apply to this poem, but before I do, I strongly recommend that you create a table somewhere in your anthology, perhaps on the inside of the back or front covers if they're free, or on some plain A4 or A3 paper. If you're doing this, then add a row for each poem in the anthology, uh, there's 18 poems in total. So when I say power, and the theme of power, that could relate to whether or not someone or something has lots of power, which could also mean freedom. Uh, or not. Nature it means relating to the natural world, uh, animals, uh, flowers, fruits, uh, I mean, water, natural elements, that sort of stuff. Love is love, you know, romantic love, uh, familial love, love between friends, or even deep admiration for someone or something. A poem could apply to the theme of war if it depicts a war zone or if it's about the effects of war on someone or something. The theme of time can mean either a specific time or the progression of time or change more generally. Um, you know, change can only happen over time. The theme of place applies to a poem if it's about a specific location or how people interact with the space. The theme of man can be applied to a poem 
that is about a specific person or a group of people. Man obviously doesn't have to mean male, but can be short for mankind and so can also apply to women. The theme of death can be literal. If someone or something literally dies in a poem, obviously the theme applies. If there's a metaphorical death, uh, for instance, the death of innocence, death of happiness, etc., then I reckon you could say this theme applies as well. And finally, the theme of religion could cover any poem that is overtly religious, but can also include poems that speak about things in a religious way or seem to idolise or worship something other than a god. So thinking about themes, uh, that's what I would have done there. This poem can relate to the theme of power, as Eddie is powerless, and the PTSD has great power over him. The poem isn't really about nature. Love, I'm hoping, is pretty obvious. Uh, it's about the love that Laura and Eddie share. It's the love that uh, Laura uses as she takes care of him. Again, war. Uh, I hope that's kind of obvious. Uh, in this poem, we see the impact war has on a veteran and his wife. This poem could relate to the theme of time. If you think about how Eddie heals, albeit slowly, uh, then maybe we can make a count there. This poem isn't really about a specific place. Um, yes, OK, it's about the effects of the Bosnian War on Eddie. Uh, there's no references to Bosnia. We don't really see it in this poem. This poem is about a man, Eddie Beddoes, a couple, Laura and Eddie, and the effects of a war on surviving soldiers. Therefore, I'd say it's a poem about man. I don't really think this is a poem about death, although if you wanted to claim that Eddie has suffered some sort of partial metaphorical death. I don't know, I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you, um, but I don't really think this poem is about religion. So, what do you think? Do you agree with me or do you think differently? Please let me know in the comments section below. Moving on, you could now watch the documentary this poem was written for. It's widely available on YouTube, and if I remember, I'll include a link in the description of this video. Of course, you don't need to watch the whole documentary. It focuses on three different veterans, but you do need to keep an eye out uh, for Eddie. He's the bold bloke. Laura also appears in the documentary, and as far as I know, I'm pretty sure she's the only woman to actively speak in it. So again, she should be quite easy to spot. As you watch that video, you might want to consider where Eddie was shot and how the poem replicates it, how Eddie treated Laura when he was suffering with his PTSD, and how her feelings about this might be reflected in the poem, and also the importance of giving Laura a voice. Now, you could make extra notes for that in your anthology, uh, should you have the space. And uh, if not, well, hopefully you've got uh, that extra note paper. You can make it on that instead. So that's it. That is The Manhunt done. As ever, thank you once again for watching this video. I really do hope it's helped your GCSE revision. Don't forget to give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, Dystopia Junkie, and turn on that notification bell too, so that all upcoming videos end up straight in your subscription feed. Feel free to use the comments section to add in any of your own ideas or bits of analysis or to ask me any questions about anything I've covered or not covered in this video. Have a great rest of the day and remember to take frequent breaks as you revise because a burned out student is not a happy, successful student. So I asked a question. Could war destroy a relationship? The answer is no. This poem has shown that with enough love and care and patience, not even war can destroy a relationship.